I want to tell you an interfaith Thanksgiving story that just happened in New York City. It starts with this guy, Imam Omar Nais. This Imam was one of the Interfaith Center's faith justice heroes last year. He and his mosque in the Bronx are a hub for West African asylum seekers who are coming into the city. Recently, through telling Imam Nais's story, we were able to connect him with an LDS church that was willing to donate large amounts of dry goods for the asylum seekers. Here's me with Elder Nelson at the storehouse in New Jersey where the LDS stores these donations. They wouldn't let me drive the forklift. This is where the hiccup comes though. While the mosque is able to serve about 100 asylum seekers every day, they don't have a commercial kitchen or really anywhere where they can cook food for that amount of people. We reached out to partner after partner to try and find someone who would be able to cook the food. And then we ran into Venerable Saboda, a Buddhist monk in the Bronx, who wanted to help out. With the help of New York Disaster Interfaith Services, we were able to deliver all of the dry goods to the Venerable's temple. He showed us his temple, and then he and some volunteers got to work. We were able to deliver all of the prepared food to the mosque, alongside some essential toiletries and other food. Here's the Imam and the Venerable on the steps of the mosque, where both discussed how their faith informs their service to asylum seekers. Being able to work on projects like this, where there's collaboration between a Mormon church and a Buddhist temple and a Muslim mosque, is what I'm thankful for this November. None of this work would be possible without supporters and followers like you. So please consider donating to the Interfaith Center of New York this giving season. So that's a little taste of some of the work we do at the Interface Center and say we are lucky enough to have Sylvie Sun with us without whom the connections uh, for that story would not have been possible uh, with Temple of Enlightenment. So thank you so much, Sylvie. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started with, um, uh, with our current assemblage of folks. And um, I think what we will do is, um, is Jacqueline, is Jacqueline, is it Jacqueline or Jacqueline, Jacqueline on? Jacqueline on? No. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. All right. Well, why it doesn't, then I have the, the um, honor of uh, introducing my colleague, Brennan Brink, um, who has been working on both asylum shelter issues and migration issues at the Interfaith Center. Um, and then before that, um, at New York Interfaith Disaster Services. Um, and I think we'll turn to him to tell us a little bit about the different types of work um, that you have done, Brennan, with this, um, with migrant um, new New Yorkers and how they're, um, you know, how they how food justice comes up in the context of arriving in New York City from somewhere quite a long way away. Yes, I'd be happy. Thank you so much, Chloe. Chloe said I'm the migrant shelter and immigration consultant at the Interfaith Center of New York. Um, and so that work really means trying to do my best to support the efforts and initiatives of houses of worship and other faith-based nonprofits or nonprofits in general as they respond to the asylum seeker crisis. And so the largest uh, area of that work involves a program we run called Equipping Diverse Houses of Worship to Provide Shelter and Respite, um, which I know Lauren is able to join us from Oromo often. And we have representatives from St. Paul and St. Andrew who joined that call as well, um, Arielis, um, and it's really a place where faith leaders and civic leaders can gather to communicate about the, the greatest issues um, that they're facing and that the asylum seekers that they're serving are facing and how we can uh, gather resources together and sharpen our advocacy um, on this topic. And when it comes to food justice, I think it was self-evident to me when I began this work that food insecurity would be an issue amongst asylum seekers. I mean, they're arriving to the U.S. with 
very little um, and are often not immediately able to work. Um, however, I actually have been still surprised to the level of um, this issue, to the, the, the scale of uh, food insecurity among asylum seekers was something far greater than I could have imagined. And the great thing is, is that there's lots of houses of worship and lots of social services that are attempting uh, to do their best to provide meals to asylum seekers. And just as far as like particular issues that face the asylum seeker community, which have been touched on and are related to issues of food justice. But for the most part, given the nature of what it means to be an asylum seeker, to be someone fleeing from another country, the food that uh, is most often served in American cuisines, uh, even in a place like New York, where there's a great diversity of uh, food, means that people are arriving and are often being served food that either doesn't meet their culture, that it's not culturally competent to the food that they are used to eating, the food that they would like to eat, uh, the food that makes them feel uh, most free, most themselves, as well as there's a, a very large population of West African asylum seekers, many of whom uh, require a halal diet. And so the challenge of a, meeting people culturally where they are, as well as meeting people um, religiously and, and meet their needs there is a really important aspect of uh, food insecurity and food justice when it relates to asylum seekers in the US and in New York City. Great, any questions? Any questions for Brennan? I know, I know Sylvia, you have done some work um, doing translating for Chinese um, uh, asylum seekers at Port Authority. Sorry, yes, I did. Um, uh, when the Chinese immigrant was uh, kind of uh, high peak at, on June, July, August, uh, and then after September, this days uh, slow down. Although you say Texas, uh, uh, in Texas border, they say the Chinese uh, uh, asylum seeker is uh, high, uh, in high number. But I check with uh, New York, uh, with Power and Adman. They say no, they didn't see anything. And now we, I, uh, how to say, we find out an easy way. They have my phone number. If just in case nobody know what in the bus, uh, where this uh, asylum seeker come from, they could be from Africa, they could be from uh, South America, could even could be from any place, uh, any country. Uh, they cannot predict who, uh, how to prepare interpreter. So uh, we, I just make a sign so when there's a Chinese people coming, uh, the receiving people like power, he can show what the information and my phone number. So they can contact me directly or I can over the phone uh, be an interpreter right there with them. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. And we now have um, uh, Adama Ba and um, yeah, hi. <laughs> Africana, and um, uh, we also have Jacqueline um, from the Migrant Kitchen, and I'm hoping that you guys might be able to um, introduce yourselves and maybe say a word about your uh, work and how, for you, food mm -hmm. justice intersects with uh, uh, work welcoming migrant New Yorkers. Um, Jacqueline, do you want to begin? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much for having me today and for being here. I'm just really, really excited about it. Um, so I'm happy to tell you just briefly about the Migrant Kitchen Initiative. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We are absolutely dedicated to ending the hunger crisis in New York City by reducing food insecurity at the community level. And so to be here with all of you is just 
really something special. So thank you. Um, we provide free meals to what we'll say New Yorkers in need. That's inclusive of anybody here in our New York City community. And we make sure that all of those meals are culturally relevant and that they're served with dignity and respect. And so all of the menus that we have are composed with our recipients in mind and really meeting the cultural interests of the communities that we're serving. We were birthed out of a need to feed first the um, healthcare workers at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. When everything shut down in New York City, we had meals on reserve and called upon our restaurant industry friends to prepare and then donate those meals to the healthcare workers working round the clock in the city hospitals. Um, what happened was we realized very quickly that the scope went well beyond the four walls of the hospital and that communities across the five boroughs no longer had access to food as a result of shut down pantries and shelter systems. But also the need just expanded tremendously because now we had whole communities that were relying on hourly work, uh, hourly jobs. Um, they weren't getting paid. They didn't have the luxury of working remotely. And so they there was just a growing need for food. Um, so as that hunger crisis continued to worsen, we scaled up very quickly. We ended up distributing 10,000 meals per day throughout the course of the pandemic. Most of that was delivered direct to home um, just because there was no central location for people to access that food. And what we've seen since the end of the pandemic is that our services and services like the ones that everyone here is providing is needed much more now than ever. Food access has, has really evolved um, because food insecurity is hitting the communities, the low income communities that we're servicing, but now we also have a layer of added services for migrant communities, um, seeing that they've really been disproportionately harmed by decades of lack of policy and, and systemic failures. And so now we're seeing that people are really making tough decisions between those that are in existing communities, paying for rent, utilities, medical expenses, transportation. Um, and then now with the addition of asylum seekers, also shelter and, and that food access as well. Um, and so over the course of these last three years, we've done 3.7 million meals, but understand that the need goes beyond that too. Um, and at the end of the day, for us, it's not just about providing meals to to address the physical benefits that people receive when, when they're receiving those meals, but also the um, mental health and emotional benefits. And so crafting opportunities to service people, not just with that dignity and respect I mentioned earlier, but also with food that is representative of the communities we're in. Thank you so much. Um, so, and before I, we move on to Adam, I just tell us where is, is the migrant kitchen? So we work out of a 6,000 square foot commercial kitchen space in Long Island City, but we use that only as our home base and we're servicing meals across all five boroughs of the city. Okay, so you have a fleet, a fleet of vans or or we do in fact have a fleet of vans. And we have even more, we have a great network of volunteers that also help us um, to support us. And some of our community partners themselves have vehicles. And so it's really customized based on the communities we're in and our community partners and what those needs are. Um, and I should say that goes not just for the transportation and the vehicles, but whether the meal are delivered hot and ready to eat, whether they're delivered cold, um, even the vessels that they're in. And so if we are in a NYCHA housing complex where we know there's access to ovens, we will often serve in aluminum style trays that go direct into the oven and onto the table. Or if we're with a community refrigerator network or a faith-based group that doesn't have access to that, but does have a microwave, then we'll be in a, an individual sized microwavable container and everything is labeled in the language of the recipients as well. Whoa. Wow. Okay. Questions. Yeah. So 
send the do you deliver it to where or like a, if a, if a faith group have like you have partnership with group that they you want to deliver to them yeah that's right that's right. And so our delivery model, we work directly with community groups. And we do that because we think the partnership is really essential. Collaborative engagement, especially around food, starts with trust. And so for us, we are we provide the meals, but we're not the person in direct contact with the recipient. And so we work with those communities and deliver direct to those communities at their frequency that works for them. And how do you select who your partners are? Um, it's it's becoming more and more difficult because the need yeah. is vast. And so when we work with partners, we're we're measuring need, we're measuring access, particularly with a need for culturally relevant meals where a community is perhaps seeking halal meals or, or um right now we're seeing a, a great demand for West African communities. And so we want to make sure that um, those needs are met. And so we layer in the partnership with also the need in the community. Thank you so much. Yeah. So moving um, on, on topic to Alma Ba, who is um, uh, speaking today in her capacity as a um, the founder and director of Africana on 145th Street, who's also been very active, as I mentioned earlier, with um, meeting buses at Port Authority and also uh, with athletes, activists, artists, and activists. So, Adama, we tell us a little bit about um, what your work is around um, food and uh, migration. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm originally from Guinea Conakry and I was raised here in the United States. So when my family first uh, moved here, uh, we had a chance to live in a NYCHA development. So I grew up in public housing. And when the pandemic hit, uh, I felt like NYCHA was really ignored. And when the foods that were coming into the public housing were not foods that we were used to. So people were just donating anything that they can donate and take pictures and say, hey, we donated this amount of meals, but this is not what our community eats. This is not what we wanted. So we were trying to substitute by getting the items that they needed, the seasonings that they wanted. So they would take the meals, go back to their house and recook. But still, that was not enough. It was There was so much waste going on. So the advocacy began in saying no. We are not accepting that food. This is what you should give us. And it required just talking to restaurants that were in the community and saying, this is what we wanted. And realistically, talking to top organizations, mammoth organizations that had the fund and the resources and just keeping them in check, to be honest, and say, listen, I understand you want to help, but you can't help the way you want to help. You have to help us the way that we need the help. And they listen. And I think we, and then the fact that I had the community support to rally helped. I think when you think about public housing, there's an image that already people have. They don't realize uh, the demographic has changed. The culture has changed. So in East Harlem, we were mostly, we mostly have uh, Asians, Chinese. Those are Chinese that used to live in Chinatown that moved up here because cost of living have went up. So East Harlem, which is also known as Spanish Harlem, is not really Spanish now. The demographic has changed a lot. So when we were doing food advocacy, we were making sure the pallets of food that we got, the fruits and vegetables, we were asking them, what would you like? Language became such a challenge. So what we would do is ask them and making sounds. Do you want Buck, buck, or do you want oink, oink? you know these were the ways we communicated with our community and it looked silly just listening to our volunteers go but it was how we communicated with our residents for them to understand and respect but what we saw is that we saw other residents in the neighboring so it's wilson Housen. wilson Housen has three buildings a NYCHA development can have up to 15 buildings um so we're talking about over 2,000 residents um, in our building, we noticed other residents from other developments coming. So we figured out we had to expand this program. We were getting enough food to feed, honestly, the entire borough. So what we did is we started calling NYCHA developments around the city. And then we did ask the city to support us and give us all the tenant. So every NYCHA development has a tenant association, but they refused to collaborate and work with us. So what we do is we relied on community advocates and said, hey, what's the nice of developing your community? Can you connect me with them? So we bought food to the Lower East Side, to Queens, to Brooklyn. And each development we went to, the culture was different. 
example when we were in queens there's a um i can't remember i think it's called queens college there's a development right across the college and that was mostly jewish residents and they only took kosher meals so that was like wow this is a great education for me because i didn't know that so uh, during this time is really advocating and catering to your community. And as you know, the USDA was giving us fruits and vegetables in these boxes. And there was one time Trump took this letter and said, thank you. <laughs> but we were asking our residents, do you want everything in that box? We were giving them the autonomy to actually take things out that they didn't want or things that they needed. And we passed it on to the next person because we have this culture. If it's sealed, do not open it. Once they take it, you can't take it back. But that's a food waste. If the community says, listen, I just want apples and uh, milk, that's all I need. But the eggs and you have 50 other things in there, why force them to take an entire box to throw it out? Another challenge that we also saw is that there were wealthy neighborhoods that were getting food, but they were throwing it out. There was a community um, in Harlem, I can't, I'm not going to say the name of the community, where the landlord actually was giving his residents food, but the residents were throwing it out. And so we were, my friend who works as a security guard, she goes, Adam, I'm going to send you a picture. Let me know if you could pull up with the U-Haul and pick this up. I said, okay, I could. So we put up signs in the building and said, hey, if you don't want your food, just bring it to this particular floor, not to the garbage, and we will pick it up. And that's what we did. We created a system. Food justice is about creating a community of people who understand. The government takes a long time to respond. So we are very important. When people ask us if you want to eat, they want to eat, they're hungry, we automatically feed them. The government goes, I don't know, should we feed you? Should we not? If we feed you, what happens? We don't think like that. But we need the government to come up with solutions that work. So now the migrants are arriving. When the migrants started to arrive, we set up operation at Port Authority. The migrants that were arriving from Texas were on a bus for three days with no meals. Uh, with um, Sorry, they were with meals, but it was MRE, but they were not getting hot meals. So it was very important for us to reach out to organizations to support us. EV Love was cooking their meals literally the night before or literally three, four hours before so that the migrants that were arriving were getting hot meals. They were getting hot, culturally sensitive meals. The city offered us sandwiches, cold meals. And it's it's like, we don't want that because that's what they're going to get in the shelter. But doing this migrant work exposed for me what's really going on in our shelter system, the waste of food, how horrific the food is. But because for a long time, the residents in the shelter system have been American citizens who can qualify for food stamps, who can supplement, they've been fine. So exposing that wasn't really... A thing. But now with the migrants arriving, they have exposed. I can send you pictures of horrific frozen peas that we've gotten or meals that were from last week given to them. But these vendors get billions and billions of dollars to feed these people that are, they're not culturally sensitive. The food is not good. You have kids that are getting sick. And then also all the food is catered to Hispanic migrants. You have a huge wave of other ethnic groups that are coming. So we are trying to combat and educate. And how can we do that? It's key for mind in the city that this is not how you treat people, whether they're migrants or not. Food justice needs to be echoed and not just, like I understand this conversation is about migrants, but when you can't just ever advocate for one group, you have to advocate for everyone holistically so that it can change a system. So as we're fighting for the migrants, we're fighting for the citizens that are in there, for the green card holder, whatever status you have, you're in your shelter, we're also fighting for you. So here in Harlem, we just got access to a restaurant that's right next door. We just got approval to be cooking meals. So if you guys want to buy meat and donate whatever you can and cook a meal, you're more than welcome. So right now we're just trying to reach out to meat vendors, to seasoning vendors, whatever type of vendors that are out there like, oh yeah, we have a pallet of salt. We have a pallet of sasson. We can donate that to you. Okay, so who can donate the meat? It's really just about creating a network and just asking people, what is their capacity? Can you cook meals for me? And then also for us to remember, these are the people that we serve here. What about the residents that live here? We serve asylum seekers and we serve the community here. The community here is mostly African-Americans, mostly retired, uh, people who have worked for the city, people who were in into civil rights movement. Um, and around the corner is actually Al Sharpton's office. So <laughs> it's a heavily... 
uh, African American community. So we don't just service migrants, we service both. So we have to understand we can't constantly cook African food and forget the residents who want, I don't know, a specific dish. So we we have to meet the cultural needs of both. But what the owners of the restaurant left for us, an amazing gift, it's um it's a warmer, I don't know what it's called, but in the middle, so we can cook different type of dishes and you can just choose whatever you want. So we right now we don't have the capacity to cook a lot, but we have the capacity to make eggs and coffee and give out bread with butter. But we're building it. Thank you. Thank you. That is amazing. Um, and uh, um, the uh, well, are there any any um, questions either for Adama or um, Jacqueline? I, I really appreciated, um, I don't know what you said about the giving people the autonomy to choose. Um, and that that seems a theme of uh, or an ingredient of um, of food justice that perhaps cuts across all sorts of um, communities. Adam, and who's going to do the cooking? The people or are you going to have a, a group of volunteers or? So we have an organization called Mother Nimble. So the people that are cooking, there has to be someone with the food protection. I get it wrong all the time. As long as that person is in the kitchen that has that, they can mm -hmm. cook. The micros themselves can cook. Um, but we have to have a first aid kit, which, which we just got donated to us. Um, so the migrants can cook, but we want to understand in what capacity we want that to happen. Because then you're going to have everyone in the shelter system come to rush here to say, I want to cook a meal. But if you just say, listen, I just want to make a five minute dish. I want to be able to say, yes, go ahead. We don't know if we want to do sign up sheet where you can hey say, hey, Mondays or Saturdays, Sundays, you guys can cook. Uh, what we were doing for asylum seekers before the, um, the pregnant women, we were allowing them to cook at a residence, a community member's home because they had a specific medical need and the city was not listening to it. So we had volunteers that would allow them to literally come in their kitchen and cook a meal and go home. So we want to make sure cases where they have a medical condition, you can literally just come and cook. So what they would do is cook up for the week and then take it to their shelter system. So we're trying to figure that all, all it out. But I think the key thing is that I'm not trying to figure it out alone. I'm asking other people who have done this work, hey, what has worked for you? What has not worked for you? Because I don't plan on reinventing the wheel. I want what's whatever whatever's working to continue working. Yeah. So maybe we can now reach out to you, Jacqueline. Yeah, yeah when, when Brenna was, Brennan, when he was talking, um, yeah, one of the, another of the challenges are the children, right? Because maybe adults, maybe we can, <laughs> we eat that food, but children were getting sick and people are getting sick and actually here in my house i have people to come and eat and cook because they were given um in the school they gave them like a food and then some of them bring me like a we can you you can have this because we we, we don't want to use it so i told them so just leave it here and then you can cook, come here and cook so, it, it, um, we've seen a lot of struggle with children as well. And if you yourself are a parent, like I know if my kids don't eat, I'm not eating. You're worried about them. And with children, especially when they don't have access to the proper foods, they cannot concentrate. They cannot learn so many, especially in migrant communities. They don't even have the opportunity to be in school five days a week because they're supporting their family as translators and helping to receive funds. You've, I'm sure, seen um, the increase of children in the subway system even. And so it's so important with children. And, and I think when Adama was talking about pregnant women, that's a perfect example of how we're lumping people together. Um, and it is food injustice because the city will say, okay, uh, you're a mother, your child needs formula, here's what you get. And Oftentimes that formula may not be the proper one for mm -hmm. the child you're feeding. And that, that goes from infancy all the way into adolescence. And what we learn too is sometimes the city wants to restrict. They're saying, okay, well, you need a certain amount of starch and protein and vegetable. Um, but people are giving, you're just saying, well, here's frozen peas or frozen broccoli and that's not culturally relevant. So you're throwing communities into a totally new environment 
with no support, no shelter, and now your food, you're, you're saying, well, we're giving you food, so you must eat it, even though all that food is new as well. And so bagels don't work, broccoli doesn't work. And it, it's really important for us to identify within our communities what those specific needs are and to really try to advocate for those to be customized so that the children and everybody can really get the food and the support that they need. To add on to that, I know when um, whenever we complained about the food to the, C uh, the city, they would say, it meets the USDA guidelines or the FDA guidelines. And I'm like, under who? Who are, are you going based on, what ethnic groups are part of this USDA guidelines? Does it include uh, dishes that we know in our community? Are cassava leaves in there? Are rice and beans included? But not rice and beans that you're familiar with, the rice and beans that I know. So it's, but it, they constantly use that line. It's USDA, but who's creating those guidelines? Are there people who've been impacted by the system or by people that you've chosen to create those guidelines? Yeah, I think Adama and Jacqueline, you're you're uh, pointing to like a really important nuance in this discussion, which is that there are such a there's such discrete needs from community to community. There's both discrete discrete needs across culture, what sort of foods uh, people want to eat, what sort of foods they're used to eating. There's discrete differences across religion, what sort of religiously competent and appropriate meals can be provided. But also all these discrete needs where a family. Uh, what they need looks different. A person who has a kitchen looks really different from the food that is needed for someone who uh, doesn't have a kitchen, who has maybe at most a microwave. And yet at the same time, uh, you two are illuminating the rich solidarity uh, across both within food issues, but also the way in which food issues is deeply related to housing issues, the way in which food issues are deeply related into education and the ability for migrant children to get uh, a quality education. And so to me, this connects most closely to a really prevalent narrative in the city around both food justice and the asylum seeker crisis that has been unfortunately being pushed from the city down, which is that asylum seekers are taking resources uh, away from existing communications, which is just a, a false narrative. And it is, can especially be seen as a false narrative when we think about the solidarity of when we're trying to build a city that's filled with food justice and a city where everyone can feel dignity uh, in the food that they're eating and preparing, as well as to feel a sense of sovereignty around preparing and procuring their own food and the food they want. Uh, it is truly an issue that cannot be uh, siloed uh, into any one particular community or uh, into communities that are are at odds with one another. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think really for any migrants and, and I know within my own family as well, just oftentimes the hunger goes unnoticed. And so I think with the recent asylum seekers, there's been more light shed on that just because of the sheer number of people who are now in the city and the placement in the shelter system. But it's really, it's isolation, it's fear. And that's that's a harsh reality for many of our migrant neighbors, um, not just for the asylum seekers, but also for the migrants who are here as well, who, who have arrived in New York City before that. And so, yes, I, I agree with you totally. There's sort of a push and pull um, when you're on the outside and, um, and you think that, that that's going on between the two communities, but it's really up to us to sort of bridge that. So you all have mentioned at least two, two, I'm sorry, Aurelius, did you want to ask something? No, just that uh, the, the other situation was a lady who is fighting cancer and the doctor gave her like a, a the, she needed to have um, green juice. And then the, the shelter just throw away her little thing to prepare the juice. and everything. So I have a juicer and she came here like a, twice, but it's something that she cannot do all the time. And this lady have like a three kids <laughs> fighting cancer. 
um, you th three have offered some examples of ways that um, just by giving people food, you can, though not always, offer a degree of dignity or um, mental and spiritual well-being. And you've offered some examples of that, for example, um, culturally appropriate food or itself or and um, offering people choice. Are there any other kind of practical tips that you would be able to share about how to um, enable like the, the giving or distribution of food as a opportunity to show, um, offer people a sense of respect for dignity and as well as mental and spiritual health. Maybe that's too much, but pick one of the four. I think for me, it's also reminding people who do food justice work to educate themselves about the cultures. So I am identified as a Muslim. I'm African. But for some reason, whenever I ask for halal, it's South Asian food that they want to offer me. And it's like, but that's not, I'm not South Asian. Um, and I think also understanding just because I'm African doesn't mean we all eat the same food. So, and I know in Christian Africans have a different dietary need, but also educating myself on how kosher works. Um, because I also have to respect how I have to give them food or how the food is distributed. So asking a rabbi, asking people in the community, in the faith community, like, okay, how do I distribute this? If it's halal, should I explain if this is South Asian halal, this is Chinese halal, this is African halal? Because it, it, it's very important to educate ourselves. Um, even the communities that I serve also understand the medical needs. I'm not asking us to be doctors and educate, like know what diabetes is, know what this is, but understand that there's certain dietary uh, restrictions for certain people. So when we, because we have someone who's gluten free in the community, oh. and that's not very common in this area, but we go out our way to make sure that they get gluten free food. Um, and that's on every Saturday and Sunday from Trader Joe. But it's just one person, but we're going to make sure we cater because gluten free, it's not affordable. It's very expensive, um, especially if you're living in a low income community. Um, but also understanding the, the places that we in, that we live, uh, this community that I do my food justice is um, it's heavily policed and understanding that my community needs more than just food. Um, so a moment to just be like. When there's a line that's very aggressive and people are very aggressive, not panic and yell. Because the minute we do that, the police rushes over and it's all of a sudden, it's, oh, what's going on? They don't de-escalate the situation. They they don't know how to, although they're supposed to. So understand the spaces where you do food di uh, distributions and recognizing, am I in a community that if they hear yelling or something happens, will the police come help or hurt the community? Um, and so I know a lot of people want to use the police to do food distribution. And during the pandemic, I use them to transport my food because I couldn't afford U-Hauls. But for them to do the food distribution for me was not okay because he's, are you protecting or feeding us or what are you doing? <laughs> um, and understanding that you, you know, I'm, I know I'm going rambling now, but just understand the people that we serve and the type of community we're in. Thank you. And and I'll I'll say from my side, you know, when we talk about food, most people talk about food directly around sustenance. So we understand that by having a well-balanced meal and having a meal in general that you have um, risk of serious health conditions, chronic disease, diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, etc. What we don't often talk about is that mental health declines as well when you don't have food. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everyone can, can just take a minute and think about what food means to you and what food means to your culture and your family. And when you're sitting around the table, sharing in food, you're sharing in an experience and that makes you feel a certain way. Um, and so for us, the use of spices, for example, you may have access to meals and you may have access to produce that you're cooking. But if you have a limited income and you receive or purchase a bag of rice or the spices that remind you of home, you're going for the rice because it just gets that much further. And so just giving food is not doing anything for that mental well-being of, of the recipient. 
And so when we think about that and offering that, we always want to look at our meals and say, is this something you want to eat? My grandmother received meals. And I remember looking in her freezer, helping her to heat something up. And I'm like, gosh, who would eat this? And, and quite frankly, like the person who's making it or, or the people who are in most city agencies receiving that funding, they're not going to eat that themselves. And so at least in our kitchens, we always gather together. We talk about the recipients. Our team has a huddle and they say, okay, here's the menu for today. Cook as if your abuelitas or your grandmas or your community members are eating this food, because if we wouldn't eat it ourselves, we do not want to give that out. And so the dignity and and the reminiscence of your culture should be not just within the food, but then also I'd love for our partners and, and for you to consider as well the way you hand that out. Because it's a it's really embarrassing to have to say to somebody, I need food because I can't get that myself. And so we we don't talk about free food a lot. Um we make sure that we're giving it out. It's not just restaurant quality in the food, but that it's packaged nicely, that we use the language um, to list the ingredients when, so that somebody can read that and could understand if they do have dietary restrictions, what they're eating. Just giving it with care um, because it takes a lot to have to admit that you're receiving those meals. So start to finish, just making people feel like people and not like they're getting a hand out there. I I think that's really tremendously well said, uh, Jacqueline. I just want to, your prompt to uh, have us reflect on food just brought up a brief reflection for me, and then I'm going to put some um, resources in the chat for everyone in this call. But so for me, the, the first thing I thought of was my grandmother who always made goulash. That was like her signature dish and it's like a perfect shelf stable rural South Dakota meal where you need ground beef, ketchup, tomato soup, and macaroni. And when she passed, it became a really healthy and helpful practice for me to make goulash and to try and process some of that grief for my own mental and spiritual well-being. And so many of the asylum seekers and migrants uh, in New York have just experienced traumatic, challenging journeys in order to get to New York City. And so as they are trying to metabolize those experiences, it is especially essential to be able to provide them food and, and uh, food sovereignty so that they can have a dignified relationship uh, to uh, food and begin processing that. So I, I'll, uh, I'll pass the Lauren here in one second, but I just want to say, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna put in uh, the chat, the link to a document we work with at the Interface Center called The Covenant uh, or Towards the Covenant. And this is trying to connect uh, faith leaders, uh, civic leaders, government to be combined on, on issues of asylum. And, and so adding your name to that will be one way in which you can find uh, ways of giving back and, and doing this work, as well as a link to our volunteer guide. And then I'm going to put a specific volunteer ask uh, for folks who are interested in working with Automa. Uh, so all that'll be in the chat here. Oh, fantastic. You just stole my thunder though. All right, I'll try to have to think of something else. Um, so I, that that was going to be, um, if, if, if you guys have, you know, you've got a, a group of people here who are very interested in this issue, um, how might... Uh, both on an ad, you know, if you could pick a single direct service action and a single advocacy action, what do you think would be um, best for, you know, people both in this, um, uh, you know, in this group and then also um, in the wider conference um, to be able to take because because this is this is what this is about. I mean, for, for me, community-wide participation is so important, um, especially among faith-based partners. It's really essential. When you talk about this spiritual and mental health um, and well-being, providing that through a faith-based institution really mm -hmm. enables relationships of trust and strengthens communities. And so in terms of advocacy, to be a voice not just supporting 
your congregants um, and the people you're servicing, but to also get to know them and understand where they have unique needs and and to be able to share those with the community um, so that we can start crafting some individual, not not individual by a person, but crafting needs. Um, I think that's hugely helpful. And also just connecting like this and allowing us to share surfaces and ideas is very, very important. I'm very excited to hear uh, and connect it to each of you uh, because we have another Buddhist uh, uh, community is uh, helping the in Holland's area uh, the shelter used to be Lincoln uh, Lincoln Collection Center. There's uh, about 800 uh, silent seekers stay there. But the problem is uh, the leader of uh, this uh, Buddhist uh, cooking programs, uh, uh, Reverend, he doesn't have enough uh, of a volunteer. And he used a church who can church is a kitchen only around 114th street and he has to move to the i mean after cooking it he has to move for all the two three hundreds and meal individually pack and delivery to 110s nearby the uh, lincoln uh, collection centers around the park area outside because we cannot deliver in inside so it requires a lot of uh, volunteers uh, manpower. Although he himself uh, is a chef, uh, he, he do all the preparation, but the delivery, the packing, everything, we are facing challenges. Power, we who work with the uh, Adama. Power has, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we'll have uh, like uh, 10 volunteers from the asylum seekers, uh, uh, themselves to come out to help. But that's not enough because preparing the food require us, to, uh, it's a hot meal, require, I was there, we have like uh, five, six people. It took us uh, seven, six hours to finish it. We prepare it and then when we move it, it's too late. They already fit, fat, they already ate. Or it's getting dark uh, in in uh, winter times. So our next meeting, I think, is next Tuesday. But I'm still, well, you know, send us, still we have, so send <laughs> us, yeah, send us the information, and um, there'll be something that goes out afterwards, so we can include the details, who to contact, where it is, and what time. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Any, anything okay. else? Anything else? I want to be, oh, sorry, go ahead, you go. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to thank you for highlighting what we were talking about in our other room too, about food relevance and um, ancestral food and the importance of cultural competency in cooking and providing food. I'm like, you know, really attuning to that, learning about it and trying to talk about it more. And the only thing I can add is um, when we're getting food from various places, there there's sometimes more um agency than we realize in what we receive we just have to ask so i can sometimes manage up or whatever and say how about lentils how about these beans how about this um and then sometimes that's fine and sometimes there's less control because it's what comes in is what you get if you get that kind of grant but um but where there is choice i've been trying to make it <laughs> So it's not just pasta and sauce or whatnot. And not that that's bad to be grateful for it all, but to, uh, in addition, advocate where I can for the people I know are receiving our food. So I just wanted to uh, put the, the, the button on that and thank you guys for, for lifting that up. I think for me, I want to be a little selfish and ask for help. <laughs> So I run a food pantry in Harlem. And I think you could also um, run and put in the chat too. But our team is honestly burnt out and we need a lot of volunteers to help us with our food pantry. And I I, mean, I spoke about briefly why um, we could use asylum seekers, but we need people that speak English because the residents here do get frustrated when they can't communicate with the person that is um so helping them get their food. Um, it takes time. And I, I'm not upset with the community that they're not patient. I think it requires a lot of 
dismantling a lot of education and misinformation that has been spread out. So until they understand that, we do desperately need volunteers on every Fridays. But then as for the advocacy part, I think it's so important as faith leaders, because I'm realizing more the power of faith leaders since the interfaith got involved with the migrant work. Because I've been yelling on top of my lungs and like, you need to do this, you need to do that. But if you have a Jewish woman, a Christian woman, a Buddhist woman, and we come in there together, we're like, yeah, you need to change that. They're like, okay, all right, we will consider that. So I, the power, I know people are like separate um, the church and state, but they really don't do it. <laughs> They're scared of us. And we have a lot of power and we need to use that. We need to reform the USDA. We need to include more cassava in there. We need to yoke um, okra, things that are relevant to our communities. So I think we have to definitely rely heavily on the interfaith community and push that more. I think that was brilliantly put, Adama. I would just say one thing a faith leader says to me a lot is you can do a lot of good for if you for in one hour or a few hours every week or every other week. So, you know, leveraging your ability to volunteer or your community's ability to volunteer or run a program on your own, even if it is or feels meager, is going to have a, a tremendous uh, effect, especially for reasons we've talked about with food. And I will just share a, a one page uh, document that we've created at the Interface Center in the chat as well on the asylum seeker crisis um, that might help folks best advocate around that issue.